Okay. Gabe, yes? Okay. All right, it is 6.03, so let's go ahead and call this meeting to order of the Garden City Community College Board of Trustees for March 2022. So just a couple comments. Um, the first is that we as the board are very proud to announce and support President Ruda for being selected to Leadership Kansas, class of 2022. Dr. Ruda was one of 40 individuals that were chosen from a pool of 600 nominations. Leadership Kansas is one of the oldest and most prestigious statewide leadership programs in the country, and it focuses on developing and motivating Kansas leaders from across the state. So beginning in April, President Ruda will be attending classes across multiple cities in Kansas over the next seven months. <clears throat> he will be interacting with a variety of experts and community leaders and uh, participating in educational trainings. But I also believe that he will be representing Garden, Garden City Community College, taking advantage of opportunities for networking and educational growth for our college as well. I believe that this is a, a very positive um, accolade for Dr. Ruda, but also for us. And so thank you very much for putting your name in there. I don't know if you got put in or, or if somebody nominated you or, yeah, that's cool. I have a reminder to the board and to our, our listeners that Garden City Community College will be hosting the 55th annual rodeo at the Garden City Community College Bronfuster Horse Palace Indoor Arena. That is 7.30 p.m. on Friday and Saturday, April 1st and 2nd, and then 1.30 p.m. on Sunday, April 3rd. So if you get a chance, go out and support our student cowboys and cowgirls. <clears throat> All right. Um, I understand SGA is not here tonight because they're busy. Um, so we are moving on to introduction of new employees. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started with the uh, student services side of campus. Joy? Come on up, Joy Savage. Sorry, this is loud. Joy Savage is our new full-time accommodations coordinator. Originally from Southeast Kansas, Joy previously served as the child development specialist from the Russell Child Development Center. In this role, Joy visited families inside of their homes to assist with providing services related to developmental screening and developmental advancement activities and strategies. Joy is a graduate from Fort Hayes State University where she obtained a Bachelor of Art in Sociology degree. Please welcome Joy Savage. Okay, turning to the athletics. Adam, come on up. Adam Shrimplin is our new full-time creative director slash assistant sports information director. A native of Garden City, Kansas, Adam is no stranger to the community or Garden City Community College. For the past 15 years, Adam has owned his own photography business, Adam Shrimplin Photography, where he provides photography services for many agencies such as Garden City Community College, Garden City High School, and numerous news stations. In addition to his photography business, Adam served as the GIS technician to Fort Finney County. Please welcome Adam Shrimple. Okay, next up, Vaughn Van Dam. Vaughn Van Dam is our new full-time head strength and conditioning coach, a native of Arizona, 
uh, Vaughn comes to us from Phoenix, Arizona, where he served as the head football coach at Salt River Scorpions Junior College and as the strength and conditioning coach for athletes performance enhancements. Throughout his career, Vaughn has had the opportunity to train over 800 athletes from youth sports to professional sports. Vaughn attended Southwestern College in Winfield, Kansas, where he graduated with a Bachelor's of Science degree in physical performance and sports studies. Please welcome Vaughn Van Dam. Thank you. I'd like to take this opportunity to introduce to you some of the newest members of our Title V grant team. And I'll give an update on the Title V grant here in just a moment. But uh, tonight, first we have Ashley Winger. Ashley comes to us from Sublette High School, and she's going to serve as our activity director for the grant. And I'll give her just a moment to just give a real brief introduction and, and the, your background. Thank you guys for having us today. Um, I'm a native, native of Sublette, and I am the proud wife of, of Gabe Winger back here. <laughs> Not to put him on the spot. Um, I have been teaching in Sublette, and I have also been the career and technical education coordinator at USD 374. Yeah, Ashley's going to start full time with us after the school year is finished at Sublette. So she'll start in, in early June. Next, we have Julie Farr. Many of you know Julie. And so she's going to just be transitioning from her role as the administrative assistant for the Dean of Technical Education and also her role with Perkins and, and other things like that. And she will be working with us on the grant. But go ahead and take a few moments. Hello, I'm from here in Garden City. This is my third year of service for the Dean of Technical Education. Um, as he said, I do uh, help with the Perkins grants and um, we've had nine grants last year that I helped manage um, and the continuing education and workforce development. So all of those, as you know, are growing. Um, we've put a lot of work into those categories as well as our expansion in the uh, technical education programs by adding industrial maintenance and carpentry last year. So we've done a lot and we're looking forward to growing even further in the Title V grant and accepting that new role. It's been a pleasure and I'm just looking forward to it. Thank you guys for having us. And finally, we have uh, Yuri Drabinsky. Yuri comes to us from Garden City High School where he's been, uh, he'll give you the background, but he's been very involved with robotics. He's going to be our robotics, the grant calls it a robotics specialist. It's, it'll be a, a full-time faculty member within the robotics. Uh, so we're, we're starting that program. He'll be joining us just as Ashley. He'll start full-time once the high school year is completed. And he's also going to be helping us develop the uh, summer program that we'll have each summer. Thank you for having me, everyone. Um, I grew up in Chicago. I went to college in Michigan and I've been teaching here in Garden City High School for 10 years. And um, I teach algebra and um, robotics and engineering. And Robotics and engineering are two programs, two classes that I've started, and I'm pretty passionate about teaching technology, um, CAD design, all of that to students, and I'm pretty excited to take that and see what we could do at the college level and start a program here and kind of see, um, make that opportunity available to students in Western Kansas. So it's a pretty exciting, um, pretty exciting opportunity to have. Talking with Yuri beforehand there, you just had seven teams qualified for the world competition at the high school uh, for robotics. So seven teams? Yep. So there are there are nine teams that got places to the world championship for robotics um, for middle school and elementary school. And our district got seven of the nine spots going to the world championship. So that's pretty exciting and pretty prestigious to have. Congratulations. Thank you. Congrats. Also, 
Yeah. Most importantly, Yuri and his wife are the proud parents of a one month old little boy that we saw pictures of today. So congrats on that. So wow. big, congrats. big things going on in Yuri's life right now. Um, if it's okay, I'll just go ahead and give a, a, a brief update uh, in several different areas. But just again, just a quick overview with this grant, uh, we have the opportunity to really turn Garden City Community College into the what we're calling the STEM hub of Western Kansas. We want students from all across the state, but certainly the Western half of the state, when they're interested in engineering and science and technology, they, they want to come to Garden City Community College. And this grant's going to allow us to invest in facilities and personnel and equipment, uh, programming all the curriculum so that we can do that. Uh, our personnel, the, the other person that's not here tonight is Kelsey Kilgore. Kelsey is going to be our outreach coordinator for the grant. So she will work with uh, the marketing, the promotions, bringing awareness about the grant and just about STEM opportunities to, to people all across the, the state and the region. Um, she's not here, but she's already working with us as well. She started last week on the grant. So we, we pretty much have our team for right now. We're really excited about that uh, personnel in place. The STEM center that you've heard about, uh, we just today, uh, GMCN went out to bid. I have uh, all the plans. It looks really great. We're really excited. It's going to be an addition onto the north side of the Faust Science Building. And so uh, you can, I, I suppose at some point, we'll be bringing you, if you would like, you can see plans and pictures and all that good stuff. It's, it's really, really great. You've included some of that in your Monday memos. So we're really excited. We hope, fingers crossed, that in a month, at next month's board meeting, they'll be coming to you to accept a bid for the, uh, I guess the general contractor, right? To, um, to, to start that construction. Our hope is maybe we start the construction sometime this summer and, and I don't know exactly how long it's gonna take. Depends on when they get those ships off of California to bring us our stuff, I guess. So really excited about that. We did have, an, so some of the programs, we get three new programs, one in crop production technology, one in cybersecurity, one in robotics. We've had our initial meeting in crop production technology. We gathered a group of uh, probably 15 to 20 people, people from uh, everywhere from Garden City Co-op to Nutrient Ag to CropQuest and Servitech and people from K-State and the Research Center and Hayes and just a lot of different people to talk about what the curriculum is going to look like, that give us input on some of the equipment that we're, we're looking to purchase, including a, a greenhouse and other soil sampling materials and tractors and tillers and all sorts of things like that. So the, the initial meeting went really, really well. We have some great partners and I think that's the most important. They were, they were very excited. Chemical application, fertilizer application, soils and plants and seed, all that good stuff. They, they were really excited to contribute to our program and excited about the opportunity to hire some of our students directly from the program. So we'll have multiple pathways that will allow for transfer to the four-year partners, but also for those who want to stay right here in Western Kansas and go directly into the workforce. Our cybersecurity, I'm working with Ron Carlson, who's already a full-time faculty member, you know Ron. So we're working on a new curriculum, also multiple pathways, one for transfer, and then a couple that would end in either an AAS or a certificate in cybersecurity. So we're working on the curriculum, um, making sure that it would transfer on to the Wichita, Hayes, K-State schools. And then finally, robotics. And as far as the curriculum and things go, we haven't even started. Yuri and I will be working on that together starting this summer and this fall. A couple other things. The summer program, which is a part of the grant for the next five summers. Uh, the first one is being uh, spearheaded by Kelsey and Yuri. We're going to focus on smart machines, probably focus on drones. It'll probably be a three-day, I say probably, it's not nailed down, but about a three-day camp here that we would have this summer for high school students. They would come here, we would learn about drones, how to apply drones, certain science and techie things and gathering information and data. And then on the last day, probably a small presentation. So really excited about that. Uh, we also are going to be converting uh, many of our courses, about 10 courses to online or distance ed. Uh, we have a committee, we've been meeting, we just met Yes, yesterday, we just met yesterday uh, to continue that discussion. Uh, two last things. We are, are right on track with our reporting. We've already submitted a quarterly report to the Department of Education in Washington, D.C. And then we have our interim progress report, which will be due in, in late April. And I see no reason why we wouldn't have that submitted also on time. 
And then finally, our budget. We uh, have all of our budgets set up. We're spending out of there with personnel and equipment and other instructional supplies. So we're on track with all of our spending and our reporting. Anybody have any questions at all that I could answer on, on the whole Title V grant project? Again, five years, about $5 million. It's really, really gonna be great. When will the actual first students be taking college credit classes? So actually uh, this fall, we'll have some students taking probably some, some of the beginnings of some of the cybersecurity classes. Okay. Crop production is a little ways off and so is the robotics okay. since those classes don't even exist yet so some would hopefully follow the next fall yeah year two okay thanks so much awesome thank you for your okay. work thanks for having us tonight we really appreciate it okay it's exciting it's very exciting yeah. Yep, take care. All right, um, next item of business is Teresa and her Christian. crystal, yeah, and report of the financial audit. Thank you. Yeah, fun. Can figure this out here. Kristen will get me out of trouble with my <laughs> where's the pointer? Oh, there it is. Very good. Um, as indicated, I'm Teresa Dazenbrock, the Fluid Superintendent. Kristen Sekovic heads up the, the audit field work. So she's the one that'll know all the answers tonight. If we have any questions, but we'll we'll work through them. Um, Hopefully you had a chance to flip through the bound audit report in your spare time over the weekend. Um, I think we provided a summarized short copy version of the highlights and slides here too. So I don't know if those made their way to you or not, but um, if not, they'll find you later with them. Um, highlights in the audit though itself, there are three actual reports in the bound audit report. The first one is the auditor's report on the basic financial statements. And it is a report that provides an unmodified opinion on the college's financial statements. So that's the best you can get. Um, I would encourage you this year, that report's on page Roman numerals three and four, five, three through five in the report. I would encourage you to take a chance or, or a few minutes when you get a chance to look through the report. It is formatted a little bit differently this year as we had new standards go in place that are trying to make a little clearer to the users what the intent and procedures and processes of an audit are and what the opinions are then. And, and as I indicated, the opinion on your financial statements is the best opinion you can get. It's what we call a clean opinion. So the other two reports are in the single audit section of the financial statements that start on page 81. The first one of them deals with um, whether or not you're in compliance with your federal funds and other programs. And there were no question costs on any of your federal programs this year. So that's great. Uh, the other report then uh, deals with controls and indicates there were no material weaknesses at the college level in, in any of the work that we performed and worked through. So no deficiencies noted at the college's financial accounting level. So. A couple highlights then out of the numbers on things that you don't usually see on a routine basis. Um, the first graph then deals with the total assets of the college. And you can see this year, um, we're, we're up substantially. We're at uh, 46.6 million, uh, which is the highest it's been in the 10 years that's presented here. Um, that's an increase um, resulting largely from 
the, the two COP issues that were issued this year. One of those did refund some of the past debt that was on the books as far as um, refunding a prior COP and some revenue bond. But the other one that was issued later in the year, um, there was about 4 million in cash that came in to the district, or not to the district, to the college right at June 30th. And so that helped pump that number up quite a bit. So. Um, the other thing that you probably don't see routinely on the reports that come out of the college's system in your financial reporting is the amount of debt that's outstanding for the college. Um, there's a number of disclosures in the footnotes. You, you have to wade through about 14 pages of disclosures on capers and other post-employment benefit information, but uh, you'll finally get to page 38 of the footnotes, start the discussion of the various debt issues of the college with a summary of them on page 44. Um, and we've listed here the, the uh, six outstanding issues as of June 30th, 2021. Um, in total, the principal outstanding at June 30th was just over $10 million uh, with the final maturity on the various issues. Um, final maturity being the one here um, that was just issued the end of June uh, and it matures on May 1st of 2036, 14 years, it'll be here quick. Um, then as far as the statement of revenue expenses and changes in net position for the, for the college, um, in total, the revenues are reported in two basic areas on your financial statements, uh, considering operating revenues and non-operating. Operating revenues were just over 9.6 million this year. That's your tuition and fees, the operating grants, auxiliary enterprises of the college. Um, that 9.6 million is up about 2.9 million this year, past year, 44%. Uh, so pretty good jump. The non-operating revenues at 20 and a half million, uh, that's where your property taxes are, the state appropriation, the Pell and the SEOG money gets reported there. So, so that makes up a large portion of that. Um, the non-operating revenues were up a little over 1.3 million in fiscal year 21. Uh, that was a 6.9% increase from the prior year. Um, in total, um, between the two of them, uh, just over $30 million in revenues, uh, up about 4.3 million, 16.5% increase, so nice trend. Um, looking then at the breakdown of those revenues by sources, um, there's really three major areas. Um, property and taxes are the largest portion of the revenues. Um, this year, past year, we were at 41%. Um, that's actually down from where it had been the last couple of years. It had been trending more like uh, 44 and 47%. Um, the second largest area is in your federal grants and contracts. Um, this is one of the areas, about the only area, I think, that saw a percentage increase last year. Uh, we were at 26%. Uh, comparatively, it's been running 21 to 17%. So, and then the third largest area is your state appropriation. And it's just stayed pretty constant at 17% for the last four years. So not a big change there. Um, we're going to look at the details behind some of these here in a second. Um, the other areas are pretty much staying the same. Uh, we did see a slight decrease in student tuition and fees. Um, otherwise, everything has stayed pretty constant. Uh, then this graph takes that same information though, and we're actually looking at the dollars in this graph and, and comparing it to the last 10 years. So you can see where the trends have been. 
Um, we're going to look at a little more detail on the property tax area here in a couple of slides, um, but you will see um, the dollars were up uh, about 941000 um, this past year. Um, the state appropriations has grown slightly. Um, it's been on an upward trend. Um, saw about a $647,000 increase there this year. The federal grants, previous years we've been trending downwards, but had a big jump there this year. Most of that is due to Department of Labor, Department of Ed money that's coming in for the Higher Education Emergency Relief Funds, HERF, HERF if I got the, the title correct. Um, in total, we were up 2.6 million in our federal grants and contracts. Um, the previous year had been up about 1.3 million. Prior to that, we had started to see some decreases in the Pell and the SCOG, which in, in most recent years had been the larger grant funds for the college. Student tuition and fees are, have been trending upwards. Uh, this year, we were up about 77,000, so a slight increase. Um, a lot of that is based on the credit hours, as you're aware. From 2012 through 2021, the credit hours have had a, just over a thousand credit hours increase for the college. So about a 2.6% increase overall. And then auxiliary, that's been down here in recent years. Uh, that's largely the student union, the books, some of those extra outside auxiliary enterprises. So looking first at the state operating grants, um, to give you a tr trend here, uh, the actual grant revenue that's been coming into the college is this blue line and the 10 year history you can see there. Uh, what the red line is, is we've taken when the state appropriation started at their base in 2003 and have been tracking that with the CPI, annual CPI changes that have occurred. And if, if they had kept pace with CPI from when they started in 2003 at the state, you really should be receiving money up here. Instead, you're down here. So that gap is, is what you're making up with from local sources, other grant sources efficiencies and cuts you make in, in operating. Um, it started out here in 2012, uh, we had about a $744,000 gap. Um, here in 2021, you can see that that gap has grown a little bit more. Um, this past year, it was about $957,000, uh, which is the equivalent of about 1.9 mils based on your 2022 valuation. So the CPI here for June of 2021 was running 6.1%. I didn't look and don't want to look to see what it's doing right now. So then the other major area in your operating and, and non-operating revenues was the tax dollars. So um, taking a look at the, the components that impact the taxes, um, basically three areas, your valuation, the mill levy that you assess determines then the taxes, the tax dollars that are levied and we're going to collect. Um, as far as assessed valuation, 2014 was the highest the valuation has been at 532 million. And then everybody remembers the pain that occurred in 2016 when oil and gas dropped. And we experienced a, a drop of 76, a little over 76 million in valuation in that time period, um, a two year period. Uh, it has been coming back up with a slight decrease there for a while. It stayed pretty constant. And then fortunately in 2021, it was back up at 501 million. So 
um, we're still about 5.8% less than where we were at that high, um, but hopefully um, it's, it's on the right trend. And in, in the not too distant future, we're probably gonna see some increased valuation come in too as some of the bigger economic development projects within the community start to come off the TIF bond process and that valuation goes in and helps this overall. So, um, during that time period then, the 10 years as far as mills assessed, it looks really drastic here, but there's only five mill difference in that, that axis there. So um, over an average of the 10 years here, the mill levies averaged 21.89 mills. Um, you actually lowered the mill levy for 21 at 24.394 mills uh, compared to 24, um, almost 24.6 the, the prior year. So um, the difference from the lowest to the highest is only is less than three and a half mills. So. So over a 10-year period, the whole, you've really held the line pretty well with the mill levy. Um, taxes then are the function of these two areas and bring in the actual dollars. Uh, from 2012, uh, we were, I didn't note that amount, but a little over 10 and a half million in tax dollars to 2021, the tax dollars were 12.3 million. Um, I mentioned CPI and we looked at it with the state revenue, uh, the state appropriation operating grant. Um, if we applied the same factors to the taxes levied, our tax dollars would be at 12.1 million. So you're right on target. You're just keeping pace with inflation with the tax dollars that have been levied. Then the other side of the statement of revenue expenditures and changes in net position is your operating expenses. Um, in total, the operating expenses for fiscal year 21 were just over 28 million, um, up about 7.2%. Um, there's four main categories in here. Um, the largest area is your instruction area. Um, it's actually down a couple percentage points this year uh, at 28%. It, it's usually running around 30 to 32%. Um, this year, though, we're seeing increases in student services, which is your second largest area at 21%. So it was up a percentage. Um, institutional support is the third largest area. It was up a percent at 14%. And then operating and maintenance of plant is the fourth largest area. And it was up a percentage at 13%. I think all of those are areas you would expect to maybe see increases this year as the campus is getting back to a little more normal online people on campus activities. Looking then at the dollars, over the 10 years, you can kind of see the trend. Although I said uh, instruction was down, it has trended upwards quite a bit here in the last three or four years. Um, student services was up substantially the last two years. Um, that's largely because that's the area in which some of the, the grant, COVID grant money that flowed through and flowed through to the students was in this section of your operating expenses. So those emergency grants and, and um, some increases as the dorm room and board numbers came back up in here. Institutional support, um, largely that's your administrative area, HR, IT fall into there, uh, legal contingencies fall into that area. I saw a decrease in that in fiscal year 18 when it was down about 891,000. Uh, some increases coming back up 
and then up a little bit again here in 21. And then dorm um, and book sales and stuff, those fall into the auxiliary enterprise area and did experience some decreases there with COVID and changes in the formatting of how, how you, the types of books you sell and such, going more online basis. And I had mentioned the, the federal fund section of your audit financial statement started on page 81. Uh, this is just a comparison of the expenditures of federal awards that's included towards the end of that section. You can see you had a substantial increase this year in your federal awards. Uh, we were up about 9.4 million in federal grant dollars spent. Um, about 3.2 million of that, well, take that back what I said. We, we were at just over nine, about 9.4 million. We were up about 3.2, so let me clarify that. Student financial aid money comes into this area. Um, it actually was down a little bit yet this past year. The increases were largely due to the HERF money. Uh, it was up about 2 million. And then there was also some of the corona, coronavirus relief funding, the CRF money went into here. And that flowed through to the college from the state. And that was an increase of about 1.3 million. So those were where the big dollars came about. Um, comparatively, number of grants that your your college staff were dealing with uh, in, in this 2021 period um, there were 37 grants in there 20 of those were major programs um, so over 90 percent so when we talk major programs those are what we have to go in and in part of the audit and look at all the compliance requirements for those grants to see if you're in compliance and, and some of the delay in getting your audited financial statements out to you was these major programs included the COVID money that came in and the federal government did not release their addendum to their compliance supplement that we have to use as for the audit until about January 18th. So almost seven months after year, year in before the standards came out to say how you needed to handle those funds. So, um, Comparatively, uh, 2017 uh, was one of the lower years here. Um, that year you happened to have 24 grants with only six of them major. And I think the lowest period in there was really 2019 and you had 25 grants that year. So, so your staff were very busy <laughs> with all of those. So um, that's the highlights out of the numbers. Um, I do wanna point out that the Endowment Association and BAA, their financials are included in your financial statements. Um, Endowment Association did see improvements this year, this past year. Um, they were actually up about 1.4 million. Um, so that was good. BAA was down a little bit, but holding pretty steady. So the rest of the report deal with the management letter and the letter to the governing body. And we're gonna let Kristen run through those. Okay, so the two letters are, they should be loose in the back of your financial, if you wanna follow along in those. I'm gonna go through the thinner letter first, which is the management letter. Um, the first page is just the cover letter as it's been in the past. If you read through it, it'll give you a definition of what a deficiency in internal control would be and when it would be a material weakness. Um, starting on that, the next page are the comments just for the college. Um, and the college staff did do a great job during the year as 
overseeing as many grants as they did and everything that's going on. They had no significant deficiencies or material weaknesses. The items we do have in the letter for the college are just best practice suggestions. So um, the first couple comments on fixed assets is just a reminder, recommend to try to track the fixed assets and the construction and process throughout the year. Have a process to track that and record it so it makes it easier than trying to accumulate information at the end of the year for the audit. And I think a lot of the problems this year too were staffing. That's so, um, it made it hard for the staff that were here to try to accumulate that information. Um, the next two comments were for the grants. Um, just a reminder for grants that require funds only be spent down on a reimbursement basis. A reminder to only draw down funds that have been spent. So funds that are encumbered, you can't draw down those funds until the money is actually spent. And then a reminder just to re make sure all the grant reporting is reviewed for accuracy, make sure all the numbers are in agreement between what the grant award says and then what your quarterly, monthly reporting is showing. And then the last two comments under internal controls are reminders just um, to review the month in reports for accuracy, make sure the month in reports you are reviewing agree to what the year, the month in balances are in the financial software. And then also make sure to review any contractual agreements entered into, make sure they're monitored so that the college isn't having to end up paying more than what you should. Any questions on those comments? That page is the only comments we have for the college. Like I said, they're just best practice suggestions. The remainder of this letter is um, comments for the endowment and DAA. Endowment, we're gonna we're, we're working on scheduling a time to go over their comments, and we usually go over the financial graphs with them with their finance committee. We're working on getting something scheduled, and then BAA, we went over all those comments in detail with Ryan and Carla and Kim, and we've talked to Ashley about them when we're there doing the audit, so they're aware of them. Well, so overall, very good job. <clears throat> Uh, comments related to the college business office itself are minor. Uh, is there anybody you know that had difficulties with transition and staffing in their office? Uh, well. I guess I would say from the perspective, we know that some of the changes in their bylaws and the number of board members and stuff have already resolved that. I think that's going to be a key factor because because of the limited staff that they have available to operate with their controls. They can't have a lot of controls. So in those situations, the board's involvement is, is a key mitigating factor. So the board's involvement in reviewing those monthly financials, <clears throat> asking the questions, ensuring that they're reconciling the bank account that somebody's reviewing it and then somebody taking responsibility at the board level that you know you you've done that review sign off on it take take credit for the the work that you do as part of those controls that's what we'll be looking at um, you know overall the the comments that we have there are are not that unusual for a small organization um, 
and and I think they're ones that they can readily uh, remedy. Mm -hmm. Well, and it wouldn't necessarily be the Board of Trustees here, it would be the BAA's board. Yes. Uh, and they should be reviewing those monthly financials and signing off on it. I, I think that would be appropriate for them to periodically do that. I, I don't know that you need it every meeting, but maybe quarterly, twice a year, certainly, because you do have the fear of the ultimate oversight board. But yeah. So um, I would just remind you that we did implement the um, report back from our BAA and the Endowment Association to our board on a bi annual basis. Okay. So that's okay. already in place. Okay. Very good. Yeah. And they have increased their board from six mm -hmm. to 18. Yeah, I, I understood that they were up to what their bylaws indicated they should be. So, so all those things will help in that process, and, and hopefully they'll start functioning the way they had in the past. Before some of the difficulties occurred. And the comment we had for internal controls, the boards, they are receiving the monthly reports. I think we just recommend they initial them. So there's um, documentation that they did that review process. So there is a review process going on. Um, it's just be to strengthen that process. So. Take credit for the work to do, so to say. Another thing, one packet you gave us that says that although we ultimately received full cooperation management, I believe it was given direct and unrestricted access to the Dark City Community College staff, we experienced sig significant difficulties in the performance data owing to unreasonable delays by management. Can you explain that? Okay, that's part of the, the letter to the governing body. So you want to run through first or do you want to? Yes, yeah. I'll go through that letter real quick. And, and then um, we'll come back to your specific question. So the next letter is the, the thicker letter that was at the back. Um, this is the letter we call the letter to the governing body. It just gives um, you guys a summary of the audit process. Um, it states what our responsibility as auditors is versus management's responsibility in preparing the financial statements. Um, it states what the plan scope and timing of the audit is. A new paragraph this year is the significant risks. And those listed in the letter are just those risks identified by accounting standards that we're required to look at when we come out to do an audit. Um, there were no changes in accounting policies during the year. And then due to estimates being in your financial statements, um, and those estimates do involve judgment. The letter lists out the most sensitive accounting estimates would be the estimate of depreciation expense, outstanding encumbrances and accounts payable, the CAPERS pension plan expense, and then the OPEB liability. And then also because certain financial statement disclosures involve judgment, the most sensitive one is the compliance with Kansas statutes. And then professional standards also require us to accumulate any known or likely misstatements we become aware of during the audit. So attached to this letter will be any past journal entries, those that we become aware of, but we don't post to the financials just because they're immaterial in nature or they clear out within you know, the month or the year end. And then also any adjusting journal entries or reclassifying journal entries that did get made, those are attached to the letter. Um, also, we let you know there were no disagreements with management during the audit and attached to the letter is the management representation letter, which was signed by management. Um, and then also we're not aware of management consultations with other accountants 
or we weren't aware of any significant findings or issues that we feel we need to make you aware of. Uh, the paragraph that you're referring to that was added this year isn't anything, um, it's not unusual. It just has to do with the fact that there was staffing changes right after year ends, you know, and there wasn't time to um, in the middle of the audit process right and, and you, you didn't have time to replace that position and, and it's just the timing issue. and it kind of left everything on the audit on hold why everybody figured out that position and getting us information and so yeah it just has to do with the staffing in the business office and trying to and it, it was resolved and, and the audit completed in a timely uh, filing wise your filing requirements for the audit for the federal grants you have until March 31st to file the data collection form and so you're well within the, the due date of that and you're within the 12 month period for the state so from that perspective it's wrapped up okay it's just a little longer than I think any of us here would like some of that's the federal government's fault, but too. So we'll lay blame on their students. So that's the highlight. Uh, we're certainly glad to sit down with any of you one on one if you'd like to delve into any details or have any questions uh, as you're looking through it that you think of later. We're more than happy to address those for you. So, and, and we do express our appreciation for all the staff assistance we did get uh, because it was a challenge with the change in positions and people having to fill in for those positions why they're still doing and taking care of their responsibilities also so uh, everything flowed through pretty well and and we appreciate the input and assistance we got throughout this. any other questions Great, thank you, ladies. Mm -hmm. I really appreciate your explanation of things to me, especially. So. Okay, thank you. And I think all of us can also express our appreciation to Carla and her team for the unmodified report, which is the best of the best. So that takes teamwork and all year round observation and financial eyes on everything. Thank you. We are moving on to item number two of the consent agenda. Um, and is there any items that board members would like to pull or discuss? Madam Chair, I'd like to pull E video board. And I would like to pull item F just to um, provide explanation to our public. I second that. All right, we have a motion and a second to approve the consent agenda, um, pulling items E and F. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda as presented, accepting E and F, please say aye. 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 Opposed? <coughs> all right, consent agenda items. 
as we described, are approved. Let's go to item B, the video board. On page 34 of your book. And Dave, I'll let you start okay. with questions. I guess the question I had, and I know we were, when we did the financing, it was 300,000. How do we finance the other 200,000? Right, so a uh, couple aspects here. As, we, as we've gone through the, the process there with the financing, there's been some things that we've looked at there to primarily what what we would be looking at there on the additional expense there, it obviously depends on capital. Um, but the other aspects are that we would have some latitude there within the findings and that we have figured in for cosmetology, we have figured in the uh, expense that would also include some alternative bids, uh, the projected options. So if we would not choose to do those alternatives, uh, there could be some savings uh, that we can figure in on the financing side of here as well. But, <clears throat> but ultimately, the, you know, the option is there is that this is a qualifying capital project that could be, could be used to cover the difference. Uh, okay. Okay. Any other questions? Uh, one message or question, I guess. Uh, we, if we go ahead and do the board, uh, you know, I was here when we put up the big board uh, at Memorial Stadium. Um, do we have people that can know how to run the board and that type of thing? You know? So the answer. Uh -huh. Simple answer to your, to your question is yes. Uh, we'll dive into it there a little bit more. You know, a big piece of why it is that we brought on at the Shrimplin as more of that creative aspect uh, is that this will be a, a piece of what he would be doing during game days here as well. He's currently running a uh, video board there during basketball games. Uh -huh. uh, so he's, he's learning the process there as far as how to build creative content, how to be able to run. Software and things on that particular board. This particular um, video board that is actually the operating system of the iPad. So everything can be pre programmed uh, you know, a week ahead of time there as far as you know, the timeouts box. Who's going to be there? The players are going to be. A lot of those things are things that can be pre programmed uh, a week in advance. But the operating software being for an iPad really helps to make it much more user friendly. Uh, so a lot of things have advanced to where it's really only one person operating the system where before it was, it was multiple. Now where you'll need some additional hands on deck are gonna be with video coverage on the field. Uh, we have students that we have on scholarship, we're gonna be working with our broadcasting department here on campus uh, with students. So <clears throat> a lot of that will be student coverage that we have uh, being covered through scholarships. Very good. Thank you. <laughs> Good point. I would say 
during games, no. Uh, but one of the things that we have been working on, you know, particularly during this season and, and to make some changes going into next season is on the operating software. Um, so the operating software that we currently have at that video, video board uh, is very elementary, I guess for lack of better words to use. But there are some updates and things that we can make where it will help to be able to incorporate more of the efficiencies and, and things that we would come to expect as far as spectators uh, that are going to be part of, of the upward package, update package that we would have. Uh, I think the other side of that there, though, too, is we've noticed a significant increase just in what the capabilities are since Adam has been on. So a lot of it comes down to what an individual's understanding, experience, and technical knowledge is. And since having Adam, there have been quite a few new additions that have been brought in uh, just in that short time. Uh, you know, the other the other piece that I, that I would say that we, that we have utilized this very much for with that video board, we've held our freshman orientation, we've held our all employee uh, in services and things. And that board has been a tremendous asset for us to be able to broadcast and be able to put PowerPoints up and, and things there. So, you know, for the game aspect, no, it's not being used to its full capacity. Uh, there are some things that we're working on to be able to, through the updates, provide more of that capacity. Um, but there are a lot of other aspects that we've been able to use the gym for, for student events and employee events that became very useful for us. On the, on the football field. Right. I mean, you'll have a separate sport clock operator that is integrated with the video board. I think the other the other aspect, and I know I, I put this in here too, but just for, for full disclosure, you know, one of the things that we've noticed since we put the stadium in there is the sound system. Uh, the sound system is very directly on the spectators in the stands pre-game music, halftime music, PA, it's, it's definite uh, when you're sitting in the stand. So one of the things that this video board as we talked with uh, the companies is that we would be able to actually outsource the sound to the video. So you're going to have you know, all of the sound for the stadium uh, will be out there on the video board. It's going to redirect it from the stand so you won't have that PA music that's going to be as definitely on the stands. But the other issue there has been some game day issues as well in the form on the, on the board. You know, when it comes to the end of quarter and a half, you can't hear the horn. And that becomes an official. And now everything is going to be through this video board to be amplified through the sound system so that you the horn, all of your house sound and everything is going to be connected out through the video board that will help to provide a better experience, but also help with the efficiency. But yeah, the play clock. Yeah, well, the shot, the shot clock during basketball games. You know, um, no, we're not, we're not, uh, we're not addressing that particular thing here through this, through this project. This would be for the football field. But the, but the shot clock through the updates you mean that we're doing on the video board. Well, we're about the feedback, the feedback. Okay. Yeah. No, that. Right. Shot clock. Yeah. No, sorry, it'd be the, the field clock on the football field. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, I think, yes, you're right. I mean, you would have the sound would be improved. The other aspect that we ran into there as well currently. Our system 
So the, the clock operating system is a wireless system. So everything that's up in the press box is a wireless feed down to the score. So if you're not in a direct alignment, you're not, not able to have the antennas that are matching up there with one another. We've noticed, and others have noticed there as well, many times the clock goes off just for a brief amount of time during the games, or the clock is not running uh, for a short amount of time because of that wireless. With this particular you know, project, everything will be hardwired. We'll be running hard lines you know, with through conduit uh, to get hardwired and from the press box into the score clock. So that we're not having to worry about the wireless connections and calling feed with the dumb phone. I think the other, you know, the other piece of this area too, just, just kind of top of the night, I think. You know, the one, the one thing that I would say with this is that, you know, this is not about being able to keep up. This isn't being able to have a video board just because school X down the road has this. Uh, is that an element? Absolutely. But that's not the reason behind it. So I mean, the, the reason behind doing this really fall in the master's facility plan. This is being able to have the facilities in a manner there that, that are quality. The gardens that community colleges come to expect as far as quality. But the other aspect there is, is that this does help with the athletic recruitment experience, but absolutely is a revenue generating uh, opportunity for us that we don't currently have with our with our field right now. So being able to go out and work with sponsors, and we have some 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 businesses and industries uh, that we've identified that we will go out and, and work with there as far as putting in multi year. Uh, marketing packages you know, to help with revenue generation and come back to offsetting this particular cost. We did not do that on the front end. Um, one, you know, because of the timing of this there, but secondly, we feel like going into, really going into a, a soccer football season, this will, <clears throat> when individuals see this, this will help be able to sell uh, you know, the revenue opportunity marketing opportunities to come from this. We're not waiting until soccer football starts to be able to go out there and talk to businesses. As I mentioned, we've identified and we worked on selling those in advance. Um, this, this absolutely becomes a, a revenue option, but it also becomes an opportunity for us to host events that we typically have not. You know, now that we're hosting the bowl, this is a piece that really feeds into a lot of what it is that uh, the national office is looking at the bowl with. You know, being able to host uh, the region and the national track, uh, track. These are opportunities that, that we typically wouldn't have without a video board there to be able to see the timing as your as your athletes. So, you know, the the opportunities are really boundless as far as what it is that we can be able to put into place and, and make available to our city with this particular. Position. Thank you. Uh, I'd, I'd like to speak to the, and maybe it's no big deal, and I am not an artist, but I'd like to speak to the reason that I think Display 1 has a better quality than Display 2. First of all, on a, there are three things. First of all, the display on the top where it says Garden City, the Bronx Buster is in the middle. Uh, you don't need track. I mean, the, the word, the, the, the letters are all the same. The G, which is different, is right in the center. The, um, and then the final thing, uh, you've got the anchor partner, anchor partner up at the top. Uh, and you have that on the second one also, but you got it down at the bottom too. I think that distracts the player. So if if you all, I mean, I don't, I don't care, but I sure think the quality of Number one is better, more professional. Yeah, so, so one of the things that actually is this both of these show static board. Yeah. So these show static board there where your anchor partners are yeah. are something that are always on display. Mm -hmm. One of the things, and it's not an additional cost, it's actually a saving of about fifteen thousand for the explored with that chronic is to go with that forward digital board 
So mm. this whole display then becomes good. So you don't have, you know, I think a lot of the things you're talking about, distractions and things, then your entire board is, is digital. I mean, as I said, I'm I am not an artist, but I just like the quality of the way it looks across the top. The rock clusters in the middle, all the all the wording is the same, uh, and then the G is down in the middle. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 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 in the middle mm -hmm. G is down here. Mm -hmm. I think it distracts having the G different mm -hmm. and the broad cluster on the end. I just to me to me I, I mean I want the bigger screen. Yeah. But I want this design. Well you can blame yeah. me on the uh, design right there because we've talked about the G R and G. Yeah. As the G R two. Yeah. So, well you can still put it down on like one number one. <laughs> And it, I think it's whatever. No, I mean, those final, I mean, those are things, that none of this is finalized. Yeah. The, other, the other thing that I would say is full transparency. What we have presented to you and what we have available to you there is the proposal that came from from Bankrom. Bankrom yeah. is the state uh, stakeholder that has gone through process there to be the stakeholder. But we did meet we did meet with a local vendor, uh, Luminous Neon uh, Dodge City. Uh, we worked with them. <clears throat> they they are the ones that have done both our video board in the middle of campus as well as one out on campus drive. Uh, worked with them on both of those signs. They're really now starting to get into uh, more of the field video boards uh, and boards doing more of the marketing. They did submit uh, late last night two bids, uh, four video boards similar. Uh, they did not send any time to point to the board package. They did receive the board late last night. One of you to be aware of that there, that there was a group of businesses that we had visited with. Uh, both of their bids on similar size boards were higher than what that promise were. work. Um, so even though that promise has a state bid, we did go out and do our diligence as far as talking to other companies. The reason we don't have those in front of us this night, but uh, those bids are higher. Madam Chair, I move that the board adopts an administrative recommendation to approve the 24 by 43 video board. Then item E. I would second that. So, right, right. There is a motion and a second to approve item E. And I think in option two is existed in the uh, description. Is there any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, item E carries. Thanks. All right, item F um, is on page 40. And this really is a, a correction from last month. And I'll let Dr. Ruda explain. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so as Dr. Douglas mentioned, this is a correction. We, we brought this forward as part of our overall tuition and fees. Uh, last month, <clears throat> caught it, uh, caught it here afterwards. There, so our service area tuition and fees. This is one that with the Senate bill, the career and tech ed dual credit classes uh, that we offer with all of our service area schools. 
we do have a differentiating tuition fee structure for those particular classes. Uh, in the packet last month, it was listed that it would be $50 per credit hour rate. But as we've gone back in there, that, that did not reflect the changes that were in effect there with fees. Uh, so it will actually be $55 per credit hour for this next academic year. So just making a, a change and reflecting that change within the future. More tax reporting. Second. We have a motion and a second to accept item F as presented. Any other discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carries. Thank you. All right, we are on item E of our agenda, the monitoring reports. Starting on page 43 of our booklet. The first one that we are talking about is um, one that we had some discussion on. Um, it's number 11 of the general executive constraints. The president shall not fail to have a college-wide strategic plan, focus on continuous improvements in financial planning, provide, oops, I'm sorry, it's number 10, sorry. The president shall not fail to ensure a safe and healthy environment on campus. Yeah, I'm sorry. Let's try number two first. That's first page following the title page there. So number two, um, the actual financial conditions at any time shall not incur fiscal jeopardy or compromise board and policies. Priorities. I'll give you a few minutes to review that. If there's any comments or questions, please. Yeah. I think it's pretty, um, pretty straightforward, right? Mm -hmm. And we just have the report of the financial audit that kind of backs it up. Everything, yeah, backed up. Um, the other part of this is that we are ensuring that our monies are being spent in the areas of our four pillars as, as we have designated in our strategic plan. Any questions or other comments? <clears throat> so then moving on to the first one that I referred to, um, the safety and healthy environment on campus. Quite a bit of information here. And I appreciate all of the athletic injury information. Thank you. Anybody want it? Dr. Ruta, do you want to have speak to it or anything? <clears throat> no, I mean, it, it is a uh, it's a lengthy report. You know, I think the pieces we look through, you know, obviously safety and health of campus, you know, there's a myriad of ways that we can look at this. We've provided our, you know, I've provided our interpretation uh, that really takes a look at everything from aspects that we've done both policy-wise uh, to align things uh, that you know, Title IX has been, you know, spent a significant amount of time this year working with our national association uh, to look at Title IX harassment, uh, 
and all of our, our policies on that end to align with national uh, national policies. And I think those are things that, <clears throat> as we go forward, uh, you know, are, are extremely helpful to be able to get an extra set of eyes and really looking at those aspects. But then the other pieces there are really just you know, taking a look under the lens of what's been done in facilities. You know, we've, we've done things to improve life. Uh, we've done things to eliminate trip hazards on site. All those things that, that really maybe many times go unnoticed that are things of, of safety elements that have been put. And then obviously, you know, just through conversations with, with the board, being able to have some very specific data points that we can look at there in respect to athletics. Uh, so, you know, really working with our athletic department and athletic training staff, again, just on facilities updates uh, that have been done, and really looking at <clears throat> what those what those aspects of facilities updates are, but also the protocols that we've been put in, policies that have been put into place. And then from that, uh, really just looking at how that transcends into treatments and the number of visits uh, that our student athletes are making, both at the training center as well as our partners at the academy. You know, again, I think it's, it's being able to try to tell the story uh, that, you know, let's let's us see and evaluate where it is that we right in certain processes, but also helps us to understand you know, kind of get a baseline of what the trends are on use of the power of the current some further steps. So <clears throat> I think the, the aspects that, that we've really looked at here are really Again, just a culmination of policy review protocol. Yeah, you know, I, I think the, I can see what you're saying there, and I think it sets parameters there. You know, what what is the benchmark? Is it doing nothing? Uh, and I, I think the, the interpretation and how I've chosen to to respond to that there is to show how it is that we are we are meeting the bar and exceeding the bar and addressing uh, safety and health. The thing I remember from day one when we that the policy governs, it has it sort of like this big, like, shall not do this, shall not do it, 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 both of the 10 and 11, I mean, they fit in with the model. Right? Yeah, and, it, and again, it's open to interpretation. There are things that the board we felt like we were not meeting the mark, uh, we're not providing thorough information on how it is. And I need to be able to do that so I can go back and respond and provide information that better addresses. So I think it is all open to interpretation on whether this is acceptable or there's additional information that we need. Yeah, just to add to the, the idea of the double negative is to define what we don't want, right? And if we say we expect a healthy environment, um, it, uh, it is not prescriptive enough. But if we say you shall not fail to provide a healthy environment, um, we are saying we expect a um, we expect you not to fail but you can 
provide the help as you reasonably interpret it. This is not a, this is a poor example. I agree. But this is a, it's odd language, but um, I still think it's important that, I mean, any of us that would have our family here would want us, want our family to be safe. And we would do everything that we can as a board, as an administration, as faculty, as, um, as the custodians to provide a safe campus, whether it's environment or it's facilities or it's policies or it's um, the school nurse giving assistance. I mean, all of those things come into the health of the campus. So I, I think it is. I mean, yeah. I think some of the misnomer that comes from safe and healthy is that it really points to physical health and safety. But there are a lot of other aspects, whether it be social, emotional, mental health, you know, that many times get lost in that equation as well. So, you know, what we what we've done as far as partnerships and what we've been able to bring on there, Genesis, Grow Well, YMCA. In partnerships help to expand on the, not just the physical safety, but physical health. It, it's really social, emotional, and it's, it's the entire well being. Well, I think that's a I'm glad we didn't uh, limit it with the athletics part on that. Like uh, Dr. Ruta's maintained here in his report, it covers everything. And we can't argue with that at all. It's covered a lot of bases on what is healthy and what's safe means to him and the administrative team. So looks pretty good to me. I appreciate the, that comment. Um, and I think it has to come from this board that that's what we expect is that all the programs, all the areas of the campus um, that safety and health is a priority. So, you know, I want those fire science guys, kids to be just as safe as the athletics. I mean, everybody <coughs> deserves that um, teacher. So I appreciate the detail in this report and I uh, look forward to further reports about it. Now, if we have comments or want to try and, and do something about the language, Leonard, in the next should be in the next month when we review the language. If you have suggestions, that would be the time to talk about. All right. All right, moving on to the job description number six. This is on page 55, thank you. Um, the board shall monitor the outcomes and professional conduct of organizations associated with GCCC, the Endowment Association and Northwestern Athletic Association. Um, well, being liaison with the PA board, 
the meetings held since last report has been monthly, well attended. We're running according to Robert's rule of quarter practices. And so we talked earlier, the audits the last couple of years pointed to not having the 12 board members that belong all states. Happy to say the last meeting, they currently have 18 members on their board. It's getting to the point they have to fight for seats. So they're happy the fall season of sports got back to some normalcy. This allowed some of the student groups the ability to run the concession stand and the BAA to get some revenue from tickets. They continue to have student athletes utilize the team sponsor fundraiser, which brought in a little over $29,306. With the baseball team leading the groups on that one. You might also remember that we signed a contract to partner with the story group to assist with fundraising. We'll be starting soon. That group uh, goes after the national brands like Dick Sporting Goods and things like that that we can't touch here locally. So. We're also playing a golf tournament to raise funds July 30th. BA will also be hosting the 2020 Hall of Fame ceremony on April 22nd at Southwind, since it's been postponed by COVID. Inductees are Bob Larson, Emily Miller, Bill Lodehall, Keith Smart, and Tamara Jones. I think everybody's planning on attending that, with the exception of Tamara. I think she's going through a vacancy right now. And Mike is doing an outstanding job over there advising, leading the group, and getting things done. So. That's the BAA report. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Um, Shanda, you she provides the endowment report and she'll provide that at the next meeting. Any other comments or questions for trustee? All right, um, I will uh, declare that the monitoring reports are accepted as presented. All right, reviewing language from our re reporting from last month, that will start on page 56 and then um, goes over to page 57. Um, this is where we look at the language and see if there's any questions or corrections, anything that you would like to um, consider for discussion. So um, these are two ends. The first one is personal enrichment. Recipients pursuing individual interests will be personally enriched. Number two, outreach will serve the needs of the community. I don't have any suggestions for revisions. Anybody else? And it looks like the answer being made from the report we had last month from the SLAT. All right, moving on to page 57, essential skills. Students will possess these essential skills, illustrate written communication, demonstrate oral communication skills, Students will exhibit critical thinking skills. Four students will develop an awareness of diversity. And number five students will develop an awareness of social responsibility. Um, we have a good report last month on these um, items that we're monitoring. I don't have any recommendations for revision. Number four and number five are well embedded into our strategic plan. So let's leave it in this one. Any other comments, thoughts? Okay. I have um, a couple more items to bring up to your attention. Uh, they are loosely papers on your in front of you. One of the suggestions from our ACCT representative was uh, that we needed to develop a professional development plan for the board members. So 
So I bring to you just a draft of what I think would go under board job description would become number eight, um, professional development of board members. And uh, so this is the policy that we would use going forward. And basically it is that we would have an annual retreat to develop the plan for professional development and trustees. And at that um, retreat, we identify the areas that we may want to explore as part of our educational development. Um, we have a budget for board development. The board chair and then the president would work together to schedule the retreat, plan the agenda um, based on the board members' needs and arrange with the speaker or facilitator. And then we would evaluate the effectiveness of that um, in our annual self-assessment. Also part of that recommendation from ACCT was that we develop a new board member trustee orientation and we did get that accomplished uh, in this past September, October. And it was you. Our, our new member was yeah. So what I'd like for you to do is just take a look at this and we'll vote on it next, next meeting. And the second loose leaf document uh, starts off, first of all, with some of the goals that we talked about at the last uh, retreat. Um, we had a retreat in February and August last year um, for some of our professional development in 2021. We had members attend the National ACCT Conference in October. They reported back to the board at the November board meeting. Um, we've had our, our one board representative to um, who participated in the QMO at the ACCT conference. Um, we developed and implemented our first board self assessment and conducted that last year. Um, we developed the new trustee orientation. The trustee handbook, um, President Ruda has been working on that and is pretty close to being done. We will keep working at it. Um, what I have for you on the, I'll go to the back page, the back of that page first. So this is my suggestions for board professional development plan for the year going forward, 21-22. So first of all, it, it involves developing the policy and improving it. Um, we already had Trustee Larson go through the trustee orientation. And so in June, I would like to propose a retreat and at that retreat we're going to uh, do some uh, discussion and, and re reference to the book that is in front of you, the trusteeship in community colleges. Um, you're welcome to peruse it. And then we'll develop our plan for the following year at that June. Additionally, I expect that some of our members can attend the National ACCT Conference. Um, also, if you are um, so inclined, there are plenty of ACCT resources on their website, educational offerings, uh, virtual classes, that we can attend. Um, if you want to attend any of those, uh, please connect with Jody or Brian and help you with that. We'll continue to participate in KACCT and the legislative updates. And also part of our development is that we then participate in the HLC monthly instruction that we do here at our board meetings. 
there anything else that you guys can think of that you would like to include in the professional development? I just want to say that I know that the, several of the board members did participate on online uh, training seminars with the athletics and a uh, small rural. Yeah. I know Beth and I did both of them. There was one other training thing. I think Shannon was on one of them. I think it would be good to mention those somewhere on a piece of paper. So you guys could give me the names. <laughs> Report it. Small group. All right, I'm going to go ahead just with my last little bit here, and then I'll stop. Um, I just provided for you an upcoming calendar events that we need to be aware of. There will be time for the president's evaluation. I sent, you're in the process of sending out emails. It's sent, it was sent. Okay, great. Thank you, Jody. <laughs> so there's a timeline of completing the evaluation. And then um, our plan is that we will review it at next month's meeting in an executive session. And then we'll go to extend the contract of the president. In May, we'll start the process of the annual board self-assessment, and that'll be sent out by ACCT to each of us for completion. In In May, we will also at the board meeting there. We'll talk about the president's salary. And that will be in the second session. Yeah, and you um, No, it's an on, it's an online, uh, it's an online evaluation, and then once it's completed online, it goes back to our human resources. Yeah, so what you haven't actually been sent the link there yet for the evaluation. Uh, what you were sent was just to review. Yeah, and then Kelly. Yeah, save that for when the evaluation comes up. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and that'll be sent out here. Yeah, and yeah, the link will be sent to you here in the next next few days. Thank you for that clarification. All right. Um, we'll finish the board self-assessment in May. In June, we'll have our retreat and we'll talk about the summary of the board self-assessment as well as participate in the educational discussions. So my question to you is the dates for the retreat. Uh, Dr. Pam Fisher has offered June 16th through the 19th, any of those days, or the 25th through the 30th. 
And my thought would be to do like a four hour evening and then a six to eight hour, like a Friday night, Saturday. Take a look at those dates and then know Well, I know I will be out of town on the weekend of the 25th. So you're saying the, the, the 16th. <clears throat> so you're, you're saying you want a, a, a day and. Yeah, so we could do like it's Friday, Friday, Saturday. I see. I see. So you're, yeah. the gap, you're not saying four days. No. no. Okay. No. Just one. Just to remind you, uh, we'll have another retreat in July that will be for the budget. Um, and we are planning HFC mock site exercise for sometime that month for us to attend. And then HFC accreditation will be here in November. For the parties involved. All right. Thank you for taking a look at that. And like I said, we'll discuss the policy proposal next month. Um, I am on item number four, open comments. There are none. Thanks. President's report. A few things to go through. I wanted to start with the, uh, it's hard to leave here almost at spring break time, but commencement. Um, planning on 2022 commencement. Uh, we'll be going back and excited to be able to say back in person uh, for commencement. We're going to be making some changes. You know, I think as we've gone through the last, <clears throat> gone through the last few uh, in-person commencements there, one of the things that we've noticed is that we are uh, having more graduates walking across the stage. We've opened up the fine art, we've opened up both the lecture halls and overflow. And uh, <clears throat> we've had several conversations for the past a few years about how it is that we can improve things. Uh, so in an effort to be able to really look at how it is that we're addressing the best experience for students, <clears throat> one of the things that we're going to try this year is to be able to split it up into two ceremonies. So in order to allow students, uh, you know, I, I think the school of thought is sometimes there that maybe we can limit and just give tickets to the students and they have to limit them in family, friends that they're inviting. Uh, I don't personally like uh, that option. You know, this is a time for celebration. This is the time to you know, be able to have as many when they're helping you celebrate. So we're gonna go with two ceremonies uh, that will both be on Friday, May 6th. Uh, the first ceremony would be at 4 p.m. And this will be the ceremony that celebrates the Associate in Applied Science and all the certificate uh, students that are students that are receiving certificates. <clears throat> and then at 7 p.m. Uh, we will have those that are receiving the Associates in Science, Arts and General Studies being recognized. Uh, so what we will do is that it'll, it'll, ceremonies will mimic each other uh, very closely as far as pomp and circumstance and everything. Uh, we will have one student speaker uh, at the 4 p.m. and one student speaker at the 7 p.m. 
ceremony, uh, but we will, again, mimic uh, everything that we've done in the past there as far as, as far as how it is that we conduct the ceremony. In between the ceremonies, uh, then we will we'll be having food that's going to be served over here in the student center uh, for all the employees, uh, just to be able to get them fed and get their energy in, in line there to come back at 7 p.m. Um, and then we will be able to come back and start lining up and getting ready for the second ceremony. Mm -hmm. This also helps us to be able to still keep nursing on Saturday, uh, using the gym and, and still keeping in alignment with, with several of our other ceremonies that we have with them as well. So, this is going to be something that we look at there. I mean, it's you know it's a great problem to have there when your numbers of graduates are increasing and the number of individuals that want to participate and uh, commencement increase. And then we will take feedback from this and see how it is we need to adapt and improve things uh, for the next year. Uh, a few other things, just want to uh, recognize both the men's and the women's uh, basketball teams on a great season. Uh, both represented the college very well. Uh, women finished, uh, lost in the first round of the Region 6 uh, tournament. And then our men uh, just played in the Region 6 semifinals and had a, had a tough loss. Uh, but again, just congratulations to both men and women's uh, direction. The programs are, are very positive going forward. Uh, this past month, we also had the play Godspell on campus and just want to commend both Sean Bowler and Mackenzie Johnson for a, a job well done and, and the production of Godspell was, was very good. Uh, over 500 that attended between the three days. Uh, so I think that's that's a very good sign there that uh, the interest is there to continue to be able to have musicals and plays and things going forward, which is absolutely the direction we're going to go. Our collegiate quiz bowl team, uh, I want to again, congratulate them. Uh, they qualified for the national uh, collegiate quiz bowl competition and finished 12th uh, in the national quiz bowl tournament. There. So it was a virtual competition where they, they uh, unfortunately were not able to attend. They had, had virtually but represented Garden City Community College very well. And then finally, just a just an enrollment update uh, as of this morning. Headcount as of this morning in comparison to last year on March 8th, uh, we are up 2.3% in headcount and in credit hours. Uh, just right at four percent. So, our goal as we've gone into the spring semester internally was five percent. Uh, there's still several different opportunities for us to, be, to enroll students and work to hit that mark. But being able to set a lofty goal of five percent coming into four percent is still not uh, not faithful. We're still achieving. And kudos to all of the faculty, staff, coaches, and everybody that's helped to get it. Oh, I have to report. <laughs> yeah, I, I went on Sunday and they had to open up the seating that they had designated there for the performers because there was so much. Yeah, it was, it went over very well. I heard a lot of good feedback, both on the play as well as on the seating improvements that have happened over there. Just need to work on the audio. The sound and audio is quite monitor. Report from Bingham County Economic Development. Mm, Don't do information. Report from the ACCT. The meeting in April, I forgot the exact date, is that April 8th? Somewhere there in Junction City, it's a junction with my feet exam. I, I have it on my phone, but my phone is turned off. I guess it's first. Uh, 
Um, Gabe, faculty senate. Good evening. Uh, so we actually had a pretty quick meeting for the last one. Uh, we were supposed to meet on Friday and we pushed it off until after spring break because meetings the day before spring break starts is just never good. Um, we approved, yeah, except all employee meeting. That's gonna be fabulous. So uh, we approved several more uh, uh, faculty professional developments this month. Uh, Jeannie Ferguson, Brian McCollum, and Ronald Carlson, all we approved all three of them. So we've approved now eight faculty uh, developments. So that's that's really good for us. Uh, one of the neat ones is the Brian McCollum one. Um, him and Michael Knutson are going to go to a training on uh, it's it's for arts, and it's strictly about large uh, uh, billboards, larger painting stuff like that. And one of the things that we've already been talking about is what uh, Mr. Root is working on with the outdoor gym. And so we could be looking at a great, really good place to uh, put some of their art up. And so some of that's already been kind of in the works. So that's going to be really neat. Um, we're, we've continued to work on just the normal policies that we've been starting to update. And, um, so that's that's been really smooth. One of the things that we're starting uh, here in the next week is we're going to send out a um, Every, every single year, the faculty vote on uh, faculty of the year, rookie of the year, and staff support of the year. So we're going to start sending out those names and start doing that voting here the next week. And um, probably at the next uh, board of trustees meeting, I should have those names for you, of who was voted in. And so that'll be pretty nice. So that's all I have. Anyone have any questions? Okay. By the way, I paid my wife a lot of money to say she's proud of me. So. <laughs> 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 actually happening now is now the writing of the assurance argument. So everything we've been doing over the last several months has been um, individual teams working on each criteria, providing kind of uh, a variety of things, bullet points, pieces of evidence, either full write-ups. Uh, but now that that assurance argument has moved on to the actual writing team itself, and they will meet. Um, I'm leading that team. Um, March through June, really, to make sure that assurance argument, the draft of it, is ready to go. Uh, we will also um, work on the writing, the monitoring report, which is uh, related to 5, 5B. 5B. Um, so we have an internal monitoring report that we will submit alongside and in with that same assurance argument. So uh, Dr. Ruda and I will be working on that, along with the writing team. Um, the writing team, myself, the deans across the institution, academic and non, will work on compiling the evidence file. Uh, so uh, then um, starting as, as uh, Dr. Douglas mentioned, uh, the mock site visit, um, really these are the cabinet vice president of myself <laughs> and council will kind of be leading that mock site visit project. Um, sometime in July, and we plan on having two um, Kansas uh, peers who are um, HLC, thank you, peer reviewers, um, who will come out and, and run, run us through kind of a mock visit. 
um, sometime July, August. I think I'm aiming right well, sometime July. Um, one of those sessions will be with the Board of Trustees. We'll try to stage it, stage it um, just like uh, the, the site visit team will interact with you at the actual visit, which will probably be over at dinner. So we'll have something in the evening involving the board. Uh, but there'll be things throughout the day that you're welcome to attend if you, if you would like. So um, after uh, there, uh, we really, one of the major goals of having the, the mock site visit, among many, is an opportunity to have external people read through the assurance argument. Um, and so we'll have an opportunity to review that assurance argument. That mock visit will also maybe hint at some employee training opportunities or study sessions that we can run about. Um, you know, here's a refresh of how our budgeting cycle works. You all, um, employees at the institution, work with that cycle once a year. So let's review what that looks like. Um, those sorts of things. Um, when we get into October, there will be a student opinion survey administered by HLC. And then if we, uh, October is also when our assurance argument locks. We can't make no more changes. And then in November, we will have our site visit um, from HLC. Here in April, a very large delegation of people going to Chicago. So and that is all that I have. Happy to take questions, comments, concerns about any of those components or pieces. Questions? Looks like you've got it very well planned out. Yes, <laughs> we're trying, right? The, the visit team is, um, I'm, I'm not biased, but uh, it's comprised of a, a large number of English faculty who, who are very um, astute because they teach it at, um, here's what we have to prove, here's our argument. And uh, the, the other people at the institution have provided a great foundation of things to work with the writing teams. So we'll get that. Uh, I, I feel as good as we have rooted those also. So I think we're in a good good place. What I would think you want is all the English help to be in. So go for it. Thank you. I look forward to putting all the pieces together here. Um, ownership linkings. Does anybody have anything you'd like to share? I'm not sure a couple of things, but if somebody else wants to talk first. Uh, last Sunday, February 28th, well, uh, attended the Phi Theta Kappa initiation. That was very well done. Uh, halfway through it, it through speech like so whereas halfway through it, they lost the battery, so you couldn't hear it. Uh, but it was a very nice ceremony. Uh, and then this, today was the Upchurch Foundation event uh, led by Paul Kyle, Joe Diotti Murphy film. I don't know if any of you saw it when they did it earlier down at the uh, center. Uh, showed the film, that he, and I'm trying to think of the name of the psychology instructor that. Anyway, she was in charge of developing the so they were. And then after they did the film, which uh, focuses on PTSD stress, uh, he did a workshop with the students. And there were psychology and sociology classes here. Some community members came. It, it was very well done. Um, he asked me if I would be there in case he needed an extra counselor in case the students wanted to talk after after the and it, it was very well done the students were attending there 
I didn't see a single one of them had a thumbnail. It, uh, it was an opportunity for us to, uh, I don't know how many of you know it, but, but went to the up church all titles. Uh, uh, he was also in the church department here. I attended the cosmetology advisory council meeting and I would just share a few comments that were made by some of the shop owners that attended and what they talked about is that they wanted to see our new employees to be business savvy and to focus on customer service um, to dress professionally and those are the things that we cover in workforce development here on campus so i thought that fit in really well there you have 25 students in cosmetology and they have 16 students in manicuring and 10 of those are from high school, which I thought was, I didn't realize we had that many. So um, they're a busy department. They're looking forward to their remodel and move. So, um, I enjoyed the, the time with them. We learned a lot that I was going on, as well as the comment about barbering. Waxing and <laughs> lots of things. I it's, it's good for me to attend. Um, the second thing I wanted to share with you was that I attended a public entities meeting this morning with President Buddha. This was a, a meeting called by Lon Kishni, who is now the chairman of the Finney County Commissioners. Um, and uh, so we're just some discussions about community event, community building and how we can partner together or make sure that we're not going off in different directions. It was kind of the first of this meeting of public entities and it included uh, the Convention Bureau and Economic Development Chamber and Holcomb School District. So uh, I think that there'll be some other meetings going forward on that. So it's nice to attend. And then I would echo um, President Ruda. I had two people compliment me about the Fine Arts Auditorium remodel. So good job. And God's help. Any other ownership linkage? Um, there's a list of games and events for us to participate in. Chamber breakfast is March 16th, and the legislative coffee, the next one is March 19th, as well as some games listed here. And then we mentioned the or the chamber breakfast in April. I, uh, if we could, all of us attend that, that'd be great. So put that on your calendar. And where is that? Very How about the one on the uh, 16th? Right. It's also the following. No, the 16th is here, the legislative. Oh, uh, that's the 19th. Oh, I don't know. Yeah, March 16th. Yeah, chamber breakfast March 16th. Yeah. 
I'm looking at April. I'm sorry. That's okay. Right. Please don't forget to fill out your board self-assessment for today's meeting. Any other items? All right. I declare this meeting adjourned. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in.